Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Hey, we're going to be in the book of Exodus in just a few moments, so you can go ahead and get there, get ready for that. I'm going to get myself ready for that, actually. We are in a series right now that we've um, creatively titled Bible Stories, because it's stories from the Bible. So that's hence the title, and I wish I would have renamed it something else. I came up with that name, and uh, I'm committed now. We're, we're like, you know, we're four weeks in. I got to stick with it. So it's, uh, it's Bible stories, and it's uh, week four. We're going to be looking at the story of Moses and the burning bush. And the idea behind this series is we're looking at all of these big Old Testament stories, ones you grew up hearing if you have a church background or you read a children's Bible when you were a kid. It's these big, epic stories of how God shows up in dramatic ways. But we're, we're looking at them more than just stories of, of cool things that happen in the Bible, but also how do these stories point us towards Jesus? What do these stories have to teach us about Jesus? Where does Jesus show up? Where is Jesus like a preview of, of Jesus, what he will do at some point in the future, things like this. And so all during the course of this series, it's going to be 11 weeks long, and it's going to lead us right up to Christmas Eve. So if you are here for the whole series, you will get a really good overview of the whole Old Testament, essentially, through these key stories. And we will be prepared to celebrate on Christmas Eve um, this you know, the incarnation, the arrival of Jesus and, and celebrating and remembering this great historic event. So we, last week, we spent two weeks talking about Abraham or Abram, whose name was changed to Abraham and some of the ways that God showed up for him. We talked about Abraham and Isaac last week, and we're going to spend the next three weeks talking about the Exodus story. So Moses and the children of Israel being delivered out of Egypt, you know, towards the promised land and that whole story. And then after the series, after those three weeks are done, we're going to talk about Joshua and the battle of Jericho. We're going to talk about David and Goliath, all these kind of big stories, again, leading towards Christmas, preparing us for that celebration. I want to catch you up on where we've been. So we talked about Abraham last week, and now we've got to fill in decades and lots and lots of chapters. I'm going to cover about 20 chapters of Genesis in the next 30 seconds. So here we go. Um, Abraham had a son named Isaac. We talked about him last week. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob wrestled with God, and God changed his name to Israel. That's a story you can read later in the book of Genesis. I, Israel, or Jacob, had 12 sons and one daughter. There was a rivalry between some of the sons, right? Joseph and was hated by some of his other uh, brothers, and they sold him into slavery, as you do when you don't get along with your sibling. Um, <laughs> this is not a tactic I would recommend. Uh, he was in slavery in, in Egypt, but God had a plan. He was using this horrible situation that Joseph found himself in to send Joseph ahead to Egypt so that when a famine happened, his, his family would not starve. And so 70 of them eventually found their way to Egypt, where they went and to survive during the course of this famine. And Joseph was there, second in command over the land, because God, the way God had used his story to provide for the nation of Israel. So now they're in Egypt, and many years pass. And we are told they show up with 70 people. So Abraham's got this promise from God that there will be a nation that will come from his family. And it will be so numerous that it's like the stars in the heaven. And 70 people is not quite as numerous as the stars in the heaven, but it's headed that way. It's starting to grow. His family's starting to grow, and there's exciting things happening. But then years pass, 400 years to be precise. And the, the, the nation continues to grow, but their situation uh, declines. Their situation is a really bad situation. And we'll read about that in Exodus chapter 1. And I know that was longer than 30 seconds. That's all right. Exodus chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 14. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, and Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher, all the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt, and Joseph died, and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. 
Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too mighty, or too many, and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Python and Ramses. And, but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. And in all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. So we see God's promise to Abraham is beginning to be fulfilled. There's, they are filling the land. They are multiplying. Over these generations, the nation is growing larger and larger. They really are a great na- nation. But the other part of the of the promise is that they would be a blessing to the other nations. This great nation would grow and they would be a blessing and eventually they would have this special place, the land of Canaan, right, that God was giving to them. But a lot of that promise is unfulfilled. The great nation part is there. There's so many of them. But they're now in this place where they are, they are persecuted, they're put into slavery, they're, they're dealt with in a shrewd way. What's the word that's repeated over and over again? They're ruthless. It's a ruthless situation. Egypt is dealing with them ruthlessly. They're not in a position to be a blessing to all the other nations. They're being, you know, persecuted and and oppressed. So how's God going to fulfill this promise that he's made to the nation of Israel? He's made to Abraham. And the problem that the Pharaoh, this new Pharaoh that rises up, he, he sees them as there's too many of them, and they're just too strong. They look like an army. There's so many of them. They look like an army. Egypt could be in danger if, if situations play out in a certain way, and these people turn on us. We're going to be in trouble. we got to do something with them. And so they make them their slaves. But even this thing was predicted to Abraham. Genesis 15, which we read two weeks ago, when God made this covenant with Abraham, he said there would, be, there would be this time where your people will be sojourners in a far off land for 400 years. He even gives them a time frame, but that God would bring them back to the land of Canaan. Their life is bitter. Um, Pharaoh carries out this campaign to try to get the, the nation smaller. And so he has the, tells the Hebrew midwives that are responsible for carrying out the deliveries, the, you know, when, when uh, children are going to be born, they're, they're there and they say, he says, here's the plot I have for you. If there's a boy child born, I want you to kill the boy child secretly. Don't let the mother know what's happening. Just, oh no, this one didn't survive. And, but if it's a, a girl child, I want you to let that one live. And the midwives, they're okay, Pharaoh, but they do not follow along with this command. And, and, and God blesses them for their disobedience to Pharaoh's evil command of trying to carry out this genocide against the Hebrew boys. Um, eventually, Pharaoh says, well, I'm not going to be secretive about it anymore. Now I'm going to say if there's any baby boys born, just throw them in the Nile. And this evil, evil plan that Pharaoh has to, to deal with this growing nation um, is this, it's, it's a horrible plan. Well, Moses is born and he's a baby boy. And the command is to put the baby boys in the Nile, but Moses' parents don't do that. They decide, well, they do actually technically follow the command, right? They form a little basket, a little boat. They said you, we had to put him in the Nile, and so we did, and He's in a boat and he's in this little basket floating down. And Pharaoh's daughter says, what is this? And discovers this baby boy and decides to adopt him and raise him as her own child. And so Moses, through God's care and through this whole thing, ends up in the household of Pharaoh, growing up as an Egyptian, raised as an Egyptian, but still is able to have a relationship with his, his family, again, through God's care for him. But Moses survives. He grows up in the household of Pharaoh. He gets the Egyptian education. He grows up in this Egyptian culture, the comforts even. He doesn't grow up as a slave. He doesn't know slavery firsthand because he grows up in this incredible place of blessing and privilege. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen um, is giving a sermon where he's talking through the history of the nation of Israel. And he begins to talk about Moses. And I want you to Read uh, just a few verses where he's talking about the story of Moses and what happens next 
where we end up with Moses in the wilderness, why he ends up in the wilderness. So Acts 7, 23 to 25 says, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, speaking of Moses, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, in the story, he was being beaten by a taskmaster. He defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. I don't even know what that was. Did anyone see what that was? Yeah. He struck him down like that sound that was just, you just heard. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And in fact, they turned on him. Later, two, two Israelites were fighting with each other, and he went to break up the fight. Hey, guys, knock it off. Let's not fight with each other. And they said, are you going to kill one of us like you killed that Egyptian? And Moses realizes, hey, the word is out. People know what happened, and I am in danger. Like, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be executed, maybe. So he goes on the run, and where he ends up is in the land of Midian, and he's taken in by a family meets a, a woman and marries her and has children and is taken, kind of adopted by this family in Midian. Now, Moses' plan, Mo Moses, has, his heart was in the right place. He saw the situation of his people. Man, they're living in brutal slavery, and this person is just being beaten ruthlessly by this taskmaster. And this desire for justice wells up in Moses' heart, and he just kills this guy. In a moment of, you know, rage or whatever, like, you can't do this, this is wrong. He kills this man, tries to hide up what, he, hide what he's done or cover up what he's done, but he's discovered and people know what happened. And Moses realizes that he needs to go on the run. And it's a little unclear what Moses' plan is here. Like, he's the one-man deliverance thing. Like, he was hoping maybe that it's like a Spartacus situation. He's leading a rebellion. Like, I've put this Egyptian down join me, you know, this act of deliverance. He wanted the, his brothers to understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. They were not on board with what Moses was doing. And I don't know what, what he's going to like, Moses Rambo, just one by one, take out Egyptians, you know, it's like, what's your plan, Moses? This isn't going to work out for you. Moses runs for his life, ends up in Midian, as we said. He, he's working as a shepherd for his father-in-law, Jethro, and that's where this story picks up of Moses in the burning bush. So Exodus chapter 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why this bush, the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely, oh, we'll stop right there. I was getting ahead of myself. This is pretty amazing, what we, what we hear happening here, or what we read he, happening here in this passage. We see that Moses just kind of going about his day-to-day -day existence, and this has been 40 years, by the way. So when he ran away, he was 40 years old. He spends 40 years as a shepherd in the wilderness, working for his father-in-law, Jethro, he kind of, his, this quiet life in the wilderness. He went from being raised in Pharaoh's household, being someone who is very impressive, I'm sure, and had this level of authority, and now he is just living in the wilderness 40 years. Living there in this quiet kind of life, a very humble life. And then one day, He's doing what he's been doing for many years. He sees a bush that is on fire. And then he notices that the fire is not consuming the bush. It's not burning it up. It's somehow on fire without being destroyed. And he's like, I'm going to go check this out. Like we all would as well. <laughs> like even, even to put it out, you know, it's like there's a wildfire. We got to do something about this. I'm going to go and check this out. And as he approaches, he hears his name. 
He's called by name. And he's told that where he is standing is holy ground. Take off your sandals and don't come any closer because you're in, on holy ground right now. When we see fire, and, and so many times fire is connected with the presence of God, we see this in, in Scripture many times where fire represents the presence of God and it's a fitting symbol, isn't it? Fire is this powerful, warm, beautiful, right, in the right context. When you, when you see a fire, you can't help but look at it. You're, you're kind of drawn near to it if it's safe, you know, but it's also this powerful force, as we know, based on our wildfire seasons that we tend to have. But this is a symbol of the presence of God. You think about the day of Pentecost and the, the tongues of fire, flames descending on the disciples' heads and them being filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, we see the pillar of fire later in the Exodus story, but fire is this thing that's so many times associated with the presence of God. All of a sudden, in Moses' regular everyday life, God breaks in and Moses finds himself in this holy moment because the presence of God is there. I wonder if you've ever felt anything that we've, we, you've never, I, I'm confidently I can tell you you've never seen a burning bush that was not consumed by fire and heard the voice of God, likely. I think that was like a one-time thing for Moses. But have you ever had like, you find, you're, you just stumble upon, all of a sudden you're in a holy moment. All of a sudden you're on holy ground. And how, what a regular, this is a regular thing for Moses. To see a bush in the desert is what the most normal thing ever, right? It's like you seeing a filing cabinet at work or the nurse's station at the hospital or whatever, fixing breakfast for the kids, whatever, whatever it might be, regular everyday stuff. But then all of a sudden God breaks in and you find yourself in a holy moment. There's an awareness of God, like God's with me here in this moment, you, and it's probably not, again, a burning bush situation for you, but you're, you find yourself provided for in some kind of profound way. You've got a need that you were stressing about, and God perfectly meets that need. And you go, I'm standing on holy ground right now. Or that still small voice that you're really worried about something, and all of a sudden you feel peace come over you, and you go, wow, I'm, this is one of those holy ground moments. Or all of a sudden, you're, you're just going about your business and you find yourself in a spiritual conversation with somebody. Standing on holy ground. What made the ground holy? It's, it's God's presence. right? And isn't that just like God to, to sanctify or purify our ordinary life, take something very ordinary, but because he's there with us, now we're on holy ground. He does that in, in moments sometimes. We need to be aware of that and look for those moments, I think. This bush being on fire but not being consumed is really fascinating to think about. When you, um, I had some basic fire uh, fighting training when I was in the military, and we talk about like the fire triangle, the three things that have to be there for a fire to exist, right? If you're going to put out a fire, you take away one of those things and you can put out the fire. Do you know the three things? Fuel air, and heat. And so a fire extinguisher and the different types of fire extinguishers does something to do with each of those things, right? Get rid of the fuel, get rid of the air, or get rid of the heat, and you could put the fire out. But this is a fire that doesn't require fuel. This is a self-sustaining fire. It's not using the bush as fuel. So how do you put a fire out like that? You know, maybe Moses originally walked over there because there's a fire and we got to do something about this so it doesn't spread and burn up the land. But he goes there and you can't put that kind of fire out. That kind of fire sustains itself. Let's continue reading and, and we'll see what happens next. Then the Lord said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen their oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt." 
But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. We we get a glimpse into the heart of God here in in verse 7 and 8 that I, I wanted to take some time to look at. He said, I have seen what they're going through. I've seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. And not not only did I see it, I've heard their cries because of their taskmasters. And then finally, the third thing, I know their sufferings. And then fourth, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. I have seen, I have heard, I know, I have come down. We see God's compassion. We see God's heart towards people who are suffering, towards people who are in a difficult situation, in particular his people. He says, I've seen what you're going through. I, and I would say, maybe you need to hear this from God this morning if you are struggling. Like, does God see? Does God hear? Does God know what I'm going through? And I'll say that God answered that question in this passage all the way back in Exodus 3. And I think God continues to answer that question for us through the promise of of, of what Jesus has done for us and through his Holy Spirit. That he sees, he hears your prayers, he hears your cries, he, he knows what you're going through and he wants to walk through that with you. He's come down, and he's, he's here with us in the middle of whatever it is you're, you're going through. When Moses is hearing these kind of words from God, like, I, I've seen it, I've heard, I know, and I've come down, I think at this point, Moses' heart, I'm sure his heart's starting to race through this whole thing, right? He knows he's talking with God. He realizes he's in a holy moment. But in this part especially, he's getting excited. You've come down. You're going to deliver your people. You're going to take them to the land promised to Abraham all those generations ago. You've seen what they're going through. He knows that this injustice is happening and his brothers and sisters, his family is is going through this oppression, this brutal, ruthless slavery And Moses failed in his objective to try to do something about it 40 years ago. And now he's far away from Egypt in this isolated position in the wilderness. And and see, here's God's going to do something about this now. The thing that you care about, the reason why you're out here in the wilderness, God is going to do something about it. But But then God says something I don't think that Moses was quite expecting in verse 10. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. At this point, Moses has got to be thinking like, wait a minute, it sounded like you said you were going to deliver them, but then you want me to be a part of that? God, you know everything. You must know that I have already failed in this very specific thing that you're asking me to do. I tried to do that once, and that's why I'm here in the wilderness, and that's why I've been here for 40 years. I specifically tried to do that, and it went really bad. And you're saying that you want me to be involved in this. And then Moses offers, he has these two questions that are really important. And they're questions I think that we should consider as well. He says, who am I and who are you? In other words, they're going to ask me who you are, but also who am I that I should do this? I, I... I tried this once and it didn't work out. He says in verse 11, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And then he says, they're going to ask me, 
Who sent me? You know, who is this God of your fathers? What do I tell them when they ask that question? So he's got two questions. Who am I and who are you? And he's given answers in some ways to those two questions. Who am I? And this is an identity question, right? Who am I that I should do this? I, I, I know I failed at this specific thing that you're asking me to do. Who, who, who am I? And there's, in some ways, like that's the question I think a lot, of, I think our whole world is struggling with that question. Who are you? Like, what is your identity at the core level? What is the most important thing that's true about you? And I think Moses is struggling with this. And this is probably a question he's been asking himself for a long time. He's this outsider, right? He's living in the land of Midian. He's not a Midianite. He, he grew up in Egypt as an Egyptian, but he was not an Egyptian, he went to his own people expecting them to like recognize what he was trying to accomplish and, and they rejected him. He's this outsider in just about every way and God speaks to him and he says, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And he's like, you have, you have an identity, you have a purpose. God takes Moses and speaks into his life and he's saying something like, hey, you're one of my people. Like the stories that you might have heard that have been passed down from generations about Abraham, like that, I'm that God and you are one of my people. God of your father. John Calvin um, said something to the effect of, we don't, we don't know who we are until we know who God is. That ultimately what's most true about humanity is that we are created for a relationship with God. We are made in the image of God. We are, our hearts are restless till they find their rest in God, right? As Pascal said, or as Augustine said, I think it was, Augustine. That we are created for a relationship with God. And Moses didn't know himself apart from this. Like he, the answer given to the question, who am I? God, did, God said, I'm going with you. That was the response. You tried this before, you failed horribly at it, but this time I'm going with you. We're not told that Moses had any indication that God was involved in his, his plot to kill this Egyptian the first time. Like that was not God's plan, that was not God's call, that was something Moses just in the moment did on his own apart from God's help and it went really poorly. But now God's going with him and now it's gonna be different. But then the question, the answer to the question, well, who are you? Because they're going to ask me. He's given a really strange answer. He says, I am. I am who I am. The God of, if, you know, here's some description, the God of your fathers. He says, I am who I am. And he says, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Which would be a really weird conversation for Moses to have with the Israelites. Hey, everybody, I am sent me to you. You are what? <laughs> and all of a sudden we got this, you know, who's on, who's on first kind of conversation, Abba Costello. No, I am. I know you said that, but, you know, it's, I don't know. But then God helpfully says, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. When we see in our Bibles um, the all caps, L-O-R-D, this is the way the translators are translating the, the, the name of God, Yahweh. So here Moses is given the personal name of God. I am the Lord. He's Yahweh. It's, a, it's, in, it's in my Bible as a footnote here. The word Lord, when spelled with capital letters, stands for the divine name Yahweh, which is here connected with the verb Hayah to be in verse 14. So it's connected to this I am or, or he will be um, idea, but he's saying it's Yahweh. That, yeah, tell them Yahweh sent me, sent you to them. And we get a sense here that God is, is both, theologians would say, imminent and transcendent. Right? And we've mentioned this in past sermons, this idea of the transcendence of God, that he is so far above us, he is all-powerful, he is self-sustaining, self-sufficient, he doesn't need our help. Like the fire that doesn't need the fuel from the bush to burn, our God is all-powerful. He is self-sustaining, he doesn't need us, he always has been, always will be, he is eternal, he is this being that is so far above us. 
That is the transcendence of God. But he's also eminent. He's personal. And here we have God being personal with, the, with his people that I am Yahweh. This is the name that I am to be known by from generation to generation. So with these two questions answered in a way, who am I and who, is, who are you? He, he now moves forward with the instructions. So we're going to read verses 16 to 22. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, or Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to you, appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt, and I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. They're given this instruction. He's given this instruction. Here's what you do. Go to the leaders, then go to Pharaoh, ask for permission to take a three-day journey. He's going to say no, but then God's going to work powerfully, and we're going to look at that next week, the 10 plagues that was sent against Egypt. He says, I'm going to give you eventually favor with the Egyptians and your years of slavery where you didn't get paid anything. They're, they're going to be, you're going to be paid all in a moment. You're going to plunder the Egyptians and you guys are going to move on. And those gifts would later go to build the tabernacle, right? These are the, the, the wealth that they ended up having that they could build the tabernacle with. This great reversal is going to happen. God's going to deliver his people out of this brutal slavery into wealth all of a sudden and freedom. I want to think a little bit more about Abraham, or excuse me, Moses' hesitation here, this whole who am I thing, and what do I say to them? And his, his complaint, it seemed like this who am I had to do with the fact that he was feeling inadequate in that moment, right? And feeling like he was incapable of doing the specific thing God's called him to do, that he'd actually failed at it. And this was not a job interview, right? Moses was not being interviewed for the job of leading the people out of Egypt, right? God, God was going to do all the heavy lifting. Moses just got to be a part of it. It was an invitation, not an interview. You, you get to be a part of this. I know you failed at this. That's why you're actually perfect for the job. Who, who would be better for the job to be the mouthpiece to Pharaoh and know how, to, like, how you're supposed to speak to a Pharaoh? Moses is the perfect person for the job, and the fact that he's been fa he failed and was humbled, he's ready now. God's been preparing him for 40 years in this school of humility, so to speak. In, in some ways, we worship God the most when we feel unqualified. When we feel like we're, God's calling us to do something, God, God wants us to do something, and it seems very difficult, and we go, I don't think I could do that. I don't think I have the qualifications to do that. We sometimes end up in over our heads and God places us in situations where we have to rely on him if it's going to go well. God gets more glory that way. God gets more attention that way. The Apostle Paul speaking about this in 2 Corinthians 12 verses 9 and 10, he says, my, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, read these last four words with me, then I am strong. It, his power is made perfect in weakness. When we bring our weakness to God and say, God, I don't feel qualified to do this. I don't feel like I'm good enough to do this. I feel like I've got a lot of shortcomings, but I know you're calling me to obey you or to follow you. When I am weak, God, God gets even more glory because it's clear that it's all God. It wasn't me because I'm so weak. You know, it's God. 
That's one of the ways we worship God the most. And, and Moses, the, the, the call continues to go on. Chapter 4, he continues to bring up concerns and complaints about, I don't think I'm the right person for this. I'm not really good at speaking. And Aaron is given to him as, as kind of the mouthpiece. And he's going to be, Aaron will be sort of like this prophet where Moses will tell Aaron what to say. Aaron will speak to Pharaoh. But Aaron ends up causing problems later, the fact that Aaron gets involved. But, but God, and God gives him some signs about how this is going to work out and what he should do and the signs he should perform in the presence of Pharaoh and things like that. But eventually Moses goes. And then we'll see, we'll pick the story up again next week to see how, how things go between Moses and Pharaoh. D.L. Moody, I, I love this quote by D.L. Moody concerning Moses. He says, Moses spent his first 40 years thinking he was somebody. He spent his second 40 years learning he was a nobody. He spent his third 40 years discovering what God can do with a nobody. Isn't that awesome? And that, that's what we see in the life of Moses. But I told you at the very beginning of the series and the very beginning of this message that what our big concern with these stories, we want to look at the stories, but we also want to see where do these point us towards Jesus? So I want to spend the final few minutes of the sermon this morning talking about that. How parallels between the story of Moses and Jesus. How do these stories point us towards Jesus? Man, there's a lot of parallels, actually. If you think about this idea of these uh, in people in need of a deliverer, you know, people crying out in need for deliverance, or, or an, even a nation of people um, under the oppression of another more powerful nation or more powerful, powerful empire. We see even this birth that, that there's this, preservation and God's intervention at the birth. Even this Egypt connection, right? Jesus, when he, was, uh, when he was a baby, they spent time in Egypt escaping Herod. And even this plot about trying to kill all the male babies, right? There was a similar thing going on in, in Jesus' story. Jesus came out of Egypt, just like the children of Israel would later come out of Egypt and come to the promised land. I think even just in this idea of like something so ordinary, like a, 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 one of the people I was reading in preparation for this message talked about a, a basic little bush that was ablaze with the glory of God and how that's a symbol even of the incarnation, of that God would come and, and live in humanity, that, that divinity would take on humanity and live with us and be God with us and bring the glory of God in this common what looked like a regular person. Even more specifically, we see Jesus in the story when we consider the way the, the chapter 3, verse 2 describes who it is in the bush. Did you notice that? Chapter 3, verse 2, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And then it says, God spoke to him out of the bush. And this is one of the more clear passages where if you're going to connect the angel of the Lord to Jesus himself, the second member of the Trinity, God the Son, this is one that you would point to. It says the angel of the Lord is appearing to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and then God is speaking and Yahweh is speaking to him. And right, this is the angel of the Lord is connected here pretty directly with it. This is God. So Jesus himself shows up here in the, in the Moses story. The one who speaks I am is God the Son. It's Jesus. Later, Jesus will take these statements upon himself in so many amazing stories where he says, I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the, um, he, he says even in front of his, the Jewish leaders that he's having this conflict with in John 8, 56 to 59, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you were not yet 50 years old and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And they knew exactly what he was saying and they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Later, when Jesus is arrested in the garden, the soldiers come up and they don't know, you know, they're like, we're here for Jesus. And Jesus steps forward and in, the, in our translations, it says, I am he, in our, in our Bibles, it says, I am he, but the word he is in italics, meaning that it wasn't there in the original translation, and so it's this, he says, I am, and it says, the soldiers stumble back, they fall to the ground at these words that Jesus says. 
Jesus is connecting himself with this story here in the Old Testament and this I am self-sustaining, self-sufficient, eternal God. We are like the nation of Israel, enslaved in Egypt before we are rescued by our deliverer. It's the people that God wants to bless the world through that we're living in slavery. And Romans 6 talks about this idea of being freed from slavery. We used to be slaves to sin. Our taskmasters were sin and death. But Jesus came as the deliverer. We needed deliverance and we needed a deliverer. And Jesus came to do that. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you for the story of Moses. And we thank you for, um, Lord, even the picture it gives us of what you're doing in this world in this in releasing people from slavery to sin and death. And the miraculous nature of your deliverance and the way that the story formed kind of this cornerstone for God's people. And as we look at it, Lord, may we be instructed as your followers today, Lord, that we, how this story impacts our life. And may we even see the world around us as people living in slavery, unsure of who they are, unsure of who you are. And Lord, may we be the mouthpiece, so to speak, to help people see who you are and who you want them to be. Lord, we know ourselves the best when we're in this close relationship with you. We understand who we truly are, who you've made us to be when we're walking with you. And so, Lord, help us to walk with you well. Lord, I pray for anybody who has yet to put their faith in you that is either here in this room or watching this online. Lord, I pray that you invite them to be one of your children. Lord, you came to deliver us, to give us freedom. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bring that reality to pass in their lives. Lord, may, may, they, may they put their trust in you. May they receive the gift of salvation that you freely offer. Lord, we love you and we are so grateful that we can have this relationship with you. And so Lord, help us to, help us to walk this out. Help us to live it out. I pray that you'd continue to bless our church, Lord. Bless this series as we're continuing to go through these stories in the Old Testament. And Lord, I pray that you bless us now as we lift our voices and worship to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm no longer-